Welcome back. We've had a nice afternoon. My name is Park Cofield, and I'm the program associate with Network of Ensemble Theaters. Now, you may have talked with me about the Net 10 grant program um, in, in either the travel grant or the exchange grant uh, application process. Um, and if you haven't, I'd love to talk with you at some point um, this weekend about those two programs. We offer travel grants and exchange grants, and it's a program about relationship building. Um, the exchange grants are coming up in, uh, the intent to apply is in December, and then our travel grants are, are occurring again this spring. So I encourage you to take a look at that. There are some cards out on the table and information on the website, and I would love to speak with you about uh, that program and answer any questions you have about the application process. Um, Cool, so thanks, thanks for coming back with us. Um, our next session is Cross-Generational Influences, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rosemary Quinn, uh, Crystal Chanel Trescott, Tiana K. Johnson, and Rebecca Stevens. So uh, this is a session that is absolutely about relationships, and uh, you're in for a treat to hear, hear their story as the their their relationship has progressed. Um, it's, it's truly remarkable to sort of see the ripple effects of the impact of the relationship that was started when uh, Crystal was a student of, of Rosemary at NYU um, and, and how that space that Rosemary gave to Crystal allowed her to develop a work that went on to have quite a life and then the students that Crystal has impacted at Prairie View A&M University, and then also through Progress Theater and inviting new members into the ensemble. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. Enjoy. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Rosemary, that's Crystal. Um, I am humbled to be standing here having just listened to one of my mentors and great heroes through most of my life, Judith Molina, a few minutes ago. Um, and I'm uh, humbled that one of my latest teachers, Crystal Truscott, has asked me to talk a little about myself and how I got to where I was when I was her teacher. So I'm going to start with universities. Um, it was a huge dilemma for me of what to do about college. I considered myself, after a healthy, rousing high school life, I considered myself a political activist, a social activist, it was the 70s, a social activist, a feminist, and an actress. And they didn't fit, and I couldn't find a world in which it fit at all to be an actor and to do all these other things I wanted to do to change the world. So I did the best I could, which was to stall. And I found myself entering the first class at Hampshire College, which needed no grades, no, no degree, no credits, no courses, perfect for me, um, where I was able to learn to think um, resoundingly out of the box and into the greatest of circles over and over, so many different circles so many different ways to approach problem solving with curiosity and passion and energy and culminated in still stalling when I got to graduation by having a, um, a final project, Div 3, as we say, Hampshire peeps, um, a project which was about the women in Bertolt Brecht's plays subtitled, If You Revolutionize the Mothers, There Is Nothing Left to Revolutionize. And now I had my dilemma. What was I going to do? How was I going to be the actress that I loved being, but in a world that I could not see at all how actors had any place? I felt that if I wanted to choose to be an actor, I had to be in um, auditions and in cattle calls in which what I looked like and who I was and how I, 
how I appeared to others would be designed completely for me, what was going to happen next. And then I heard about the work of Joseph Chaikin and the Open Theater, in which actors had a place as themselves, even in interpretive roles, each actor brought with them their whole story. And then also the, the realm and the worlds of creative collaboration, collective creations, collective collaborations, in which actors were as much a part of the making of a theater piece as the writer, as the director, as the designers, and that everyone needed everyone. And I flew to New York City. Or actually, I didn't fly, <laughs> I'm sure I hitchhiked, but I got to New York City <laughs> and um, became part of, the, I was a rehearsal assistant for the last open theater project around these heroes of mine and continued to work with Joe, alongside Joe and for Joe for the rest of his life and began to work in many different ensemble theaters in New York City, the downtown world. I um, was very lucky to originate a lot of roles and to be part of um, a number of different uh, places where actors, who the actors were and what they brought to the table was part of what the story became and what the theater became. At uh, Crystal's suggestion and Mark's as well, thank you Mark, <laughs> um, I'm going to read something from a piece that I uh, wrote with a group of actors in 1984 that was done at La Mama. It was a piece that we worked at, we worked on the piece together for many months for actresses and I, one of those actresses at that time is sitting in this room that is Ms. Sabrina Hamilton. And um, we, we worked and asked the question, why are the lines so long in the women's bathrooms? And that was a very political, it still is, very social, political piece. And um, most of the piece was, the, was women coming as different characters, so lots and lots of sort of sketch comedy of standing in line, and the actresses would be different characters all the time when they came, and there was one constant character who did not speak through the whole piece, but one of the walls in the back of the stage was the graffiti wall. Hey, I suddenly realized I'm really missing graffiti in the bathrooms. I just have to tell you that in the 80s, there was graf fabulous graffiti in all bathrooms that I went to. And so we collected them, and part of it was this graffiti. But at the end of the piece, after all sorts of interrupted, fractured conversations, just you know, one-liners mostly, throwing at each other, and women going in and out of the stalls, yeah, 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 waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, the one character who has not spoken through the whole piece comes out, she's the cleaning woman, and she wipes the graffiti that has been last left on the graffiti wall, which says, employees must wash walls before leaving. <laughs> and she speaks to the audience and says, there's an order to the routine. First, you gotta check your stock. Sometimes you get a cart, has shelves, handle, wheels, the whole thing, and that makes it easier. You can stay back and, you know, stand back and remember what's missing. Tissues, sponges, brushes, mops. You know, even the littlest, safest objects can be dangerous. I was working in a nursing home when this guy would try and kill himself by eating Kleenex. They had to watch him like a hawk. And absolutely no tissues in his room. You'd be just up there looking around, just checking, just doing the job, and he'd ask for a tissue. You know, just like a regular guy, and you'd look around and you'd say, there's no tissues around here, how am I gonna get them? And then you'd remember, no, think, oh, what's the, what's the point? What's the problem with handing the guy a tissue? I don't know what you do for a living, but you always gotta be on the ball. If you don't get a cart, those plastic yellow buckets aren't bad. Buckets on wheels, fit your mops, fit your sponges, all right in. You know, a lot of people say things about cleaning the mirrors. Okay, newspaper, glass plus, or uh, what have you, Windex. My big problem is not what you use. Anything works if you wipe the streaks long enough. My big question is, how do you get to the mirrors? If you plan it right and no one's gonna walk in on you, I just climb up on the sink. 
sinks, you gotta whoosh, 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 wipe, 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 and then, you know, it's true, it's finished, but uh, it's a lot of hair, but that's not really a problem. What's difficult is toilets. That's another story. Let's just say you get back down in there, and it's not always so easy, you do what you can, you get yourself, uh, you know, done day to day, and uh, then they're clean. I mean, they're clean, I do the job. A lot of those uh, fancy places like motels, supposed to guarantee clean, you know, those sanitized strips, well, I wouldn't lick that toilet seat. She walks away, goes to the graffiti wall, writes the next graffiti on it, which is, now that they can send men to the moon, why don't they? Thank you. <laughs> so La Mama, Ensemble Theater, Ladies' Lounge with the actresses. I also did a piece on uh, relationships that was in the rules of a boxing match on rooftops called Watch My Lips. Another ensemble piece about um, life as a waitress called And Now We Are Fiction. And um, one, and you know, trying to do a million things in New York City, one of the things I did to support my habit in the theater was to start teaching, which I rather loved. I was teaching an improvisation class as an adjunct at New York University. And then one day I got a phone call from the director then of the experimental theater wing at Tisch School of the Arts, New York University, Wendell Beavers, who said, um, Steve Wong and I were talking and we thought that you would be the perfect person to teach self-scripting. Would you come in and talk to us about that? And I said, sure, yeah, see you tomorrow hung up the phone and called everyone I knew to ask, what the hell is self-scripting? <laughs> After finding out it made a little bit of sense that yes, of course, I'd be the one to teach. That's exactly what all these actresses or actors or companies and I had been doing for years and years, but I didn't really know how to teach it. I said yes anyway and dove in and loved the classes and the classrooms. And after a number of years, I got myself sort of adept. I was always an interesting challenge and always fun, but there I was at New York University teaching self-scripting at the Experimental Theater Wing. Meanwhile, meanwhile um, I'm arriving to NYU as a freshman from Houston, Texas, coming with a very rich uh, cultural and artistic background that was rooted in community and the use of art to affect change and all of those things and and I had been told throughout my high school career that NYU was one of the places to be I hadn't really made a decision about college one way or the other I knew that I didn't want to well I knew that it was non-negotiable in my family that that it wasn't necessarily what you wanted to do but you were going so um, but I hadn't really thought about I, I hadn't found the language to talk about the kind of artist that I wanted to be yet when people in my world heard theater, they automatically thought that that meant you wanted to be on Broadway. And I knew even this young version of myself that I wanted to do more, that I wanted to continue doing this practice that was rooted in the way that I was raised, that saw art as a necessity for life and for community building and for peace building and for progress building. Um, but so I ap applied to NYU early decision. I didn't apply to any other school. I got in, everybody said this was a good place to be. And I came to New NYU and was, um, was frustrated. I was mad. Um, I did not enjoy it. NYU at the time had a system of, of studios where a student, when you entered, were asked, everyone was asked to pick a studio or you were placed in a studio that focused on a certain methodology. And you were asked to stay in that studio for, I think it was two to three years, and then your last year you could kind of explore X, Y, and Z. Well, I got to NYU, and within my first year, I had already gone through three studios. Um, <laughs> I was very outspoken about my experience, but some of the things that um, were a part of that was just that I felt um, increasingly in a situation where I was being confronted with a lot of assumptions and projections that I wasn't accustomed to. I'd come from a community that was very um, 
diverse and very culturally engaged, and I hadn't been used to seeing myself as an other to anybody. And all of a sudden, I was put in a position where I was the other to everybody. And even as the student, I was constantly asked to educate the room about who I was and the complexity of what I represented. And I had an attitude about it because I was there to develop as an artist and, and to you know explore in all of those um, different ways so that when I would get in these conversations with teachers or administrators about colorblind casting and how I thought that was a very violent erasure of culture and individuality that even though it was meant to quote unquote include, it ended up really reinforcing this same kind of white male normative standard and that everyone else just erased themselves to do this play that was really written for white people. And so I was, you know, very outspoken about that experience and was getting a little um, um, disenchanted, you know, I would say about performance opportunities and just finding a space where I could really begin to figure out this thing that I wanted my career to look like that I had no model for at that um, at that particular moment. I knew it wasn't an industry night. I knew NYU also had an industry night at the time, right? When, when you were graduating senior, all of these agents would you know, come and there were so many people who were just on it. They had headshots, they did, and I just knew it wasn't me. But I didn't know what else to do. And so, um, so long story short, I'm in studio number four and it's still not, you know, there were some beautiful things about, about the studios. I'm realizing now that I was very fortunate to be able to kind of create my own degree plan. Um, <laughs> I think they probably, NYU probably would appreciate it if we'd agreed on that beforehand, as opposed to <laughs> as I went from place to place. But, um, and, and I was working with a, a fellow student who was doing a student independent project. And I said, what studio is that? Were you doing an independent student project? I said, you're not in classes? You're just getting to explore what you want to do and who you want to be? Which one is that? And she said, ETW, and I ended up being in her piece, and she said, Crystal, you've gotta give ETW a try. And at this point, it was kind of last straw. I mean, I was a junior, so I wasn't going anywhere, but I felt like I was kind of running out of studio options. So I landed at ETW, and one of the first classes I signed up for, or I was in, was Rosemary's self-scripting class, and I thought, what? Crystal came with a warning. <laughs> Teachers agreed that she was a good student, excellent student, and um, lovely woman, but had an attitude. I'm glad you said it first. <laughs> had an attitude, and that sometimes it was hard to figure out how to warm her up and get her, get her um, excited about doing what she wanted to do. I think we all had the sense that there was a lot that Crystal was angry about that we hadn't heard about, understandably. Um, but she came into my class and one of the first, in, within about the first week I understood why there was a warning and I understood that I was so eager and curious to find out what was, who Crystal was. And we got into sort of a tussle about an assignment, not really, Chris was always an extremely respectful student, but we got into enough of a tussle about an assignment that I said, okay, you have a different assignment. I want you to come to class, you know, I want you to come back next, next class, and I want you to have written what it is you want to do, not doing it, just what do you want to do? So Crystal came to the next class, and. She uh, spoke to us and said, I want to be a character in front of an audience. And I want for the audience to realize over and over again that they have completely made up assumptions and expectations about this person. And I want those to fall and I want those to clatter and I want those to disappear. I want this transformation in the audience's perception of that person and to realize all that they've mistakenly placed on another person. And the room was so silent, I will always remember this moment because it was so clear to me, first of all, that it was clear to Crystal and that it was clear to all of us that not only was she going to be able to do it, but it was gonna be phenomenal. So I said, okay. Next class, let's see that monologue. 
next class. I think the first assignment was on a Wednesday, and so on Friday, Crystal walked in with a woman named Peaches. So, this is the story of me and Big Mike, my baby's daddy. So, you know, I had an abortion when I was 15, right? Some fool said he loved me and I was so stupid. I believed him. Know what my definition of a fool is? Believing that no matter how many sorry brothers they say are out there, only the good ones will be with me. <laughs> That was me, believing only the good ones would be with me. And then I was a double fool for listening to some bitty old white nurse telling me that an abortion was the best thing. I was 15. I look back on that, I say, how she gonna know what's best for me? She ain't even much know me. And that abortion give me nightmares to this day. All the babies I got now. And still some nights I lay up thinking about that one baby. So anyway, it messed with me, and I decided the next time I was going to have sex was when I got married. And here I am, 24 years old, with four kids, all by myself. I hadn't planned on getting pregnant for at least another 10, 12 years, but I met Big Mike when he was 16, when I was 16 and he was 18, and he said he loved me, and he wasn't lying. My mama said, if he loved me for real, he'd respect my decision not to have sex till I got married. I knew she was saying right, and I told him that. So we got married three months later and lived in this small apartment in the projects. My parents like to die. And I got pregnant the next month. Oh, you know my parents like to die. Mama say, I got pregnant faster than the Lord allowed. <laughs> and don't you know, when I first got pregnant, I didn't even want to be having no babies. I was 16. Ain't been married but a month. I wanted me and Big Mike to have 20-something years worth of, 20-something uh, years before we had kids. But the doctor said, you gonna have a baby unless you do something about it. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. Because it wasn't no way I was gonna have another abortion. And I didn't know what Big Mike would say. Because everybody say a man think a woman trying to trap him in a marriage. But I ain't want to trap Big Mike. I love him. But I was scared. So I told him while he was in the bathroom. I say through the door, Big Mike, I'm gonna have a baby. <laughs> And Lord, Big Mike got so happy, I didn't even much hear the toilet flush. So I let myself be happy because he was, and we spent those nine months happy together. She goes on and on, because there are four kids to come, you see. So she's got a long story to tell. But um, it was really the first moment for me where I was able to articulate what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it, and I was given the space to explore what it would look like. So this one character of Peaches became my um, senior student independent project that Rosemary and ETW supported with, you know, a, a great abandon, you know, just uh, supported it in a great way. And it also became an opportunity for um, myself and other students to have conversations around race and stereotype that were really roaming through our classrooms and our creative spaces and all of these types of ways. It became an, an entry point to discuss all of those things. And so um, it also taught me about what I wanted work to do and how I wanted work to engage, that I wanted it to live off of the stage. And the, the performance as my independent project was so popular, I would come back to Rosemary, I think I had like two or three days to do it, and I said, oh, can we add another show on this day because we were sold out. We kept like breaking fire codes. I don't know if you ever knew that, oops. <laughs> but we, we would, it was a small black box and we just crowded as many folks as we, um, as we could, could in there. And, um, and, and, and the dialogue continued and it was the start of a career. But I didn't know that, I didn't know that. I just knew that I had really supportive um, professors. So uh, the least of my problems was the fire code. My big problem was that I had recently become the director of the Experimental Theater Wing and that all my friends were in the downtown theater all around me, producers, the other theater companies. I had promised them I wouldn't just call them up every time there was a good student. I was in trouble. So I called Mark Russell 
said, Mark, I know I told you I wasn't going to do this, but I've changed my mind. You have to come and see Peaches. And he did. And that was the beginning of my professional career. Um, Mark Russell with Roberta Uno at New World Theater co-commissioned Peaches through the National Performance Network. And before we graduated, um, we began to tour this project, right? Um, the first place that we did with New World Theater was in partnership with Co-Festival, um, which Rosemary already gave a shout out to Sabrina, but was there at the beginning when we were still these college kids figuring out how to do it. And so the touring began and engaging with communities began and having the same conversations with theaters and presenters that I'd been having with NYU over these years about race and community and identity. Who knew that it was my training ground? Um, but it was continued, you know, as, as I continued to explore race and gender in class, identity and community. And then it became not enough just to tour and perform and engage with those communities. We began to go into schools and I'd always said I would not be a teacher. You know, there were other people in the ensemble who loved kids, and I said, I don't have the patience to be a teacher. You know, I'm looking at my student who's laughing. She's like, indeed. Um, but <laughs> I said, I don't have the patience to be a teacher. Um, but eventually, you know, I, I did some adjunct here and there, but what happened and probably what was meant to happen is that my ensemble practice found its way into my classroom practice. And there began to be a call and response where I couldn't see either of them as separate, right? It seemed like both of those spaces needed to, um, needed to exist. And so fast forward to today, the next part of that call and response is that I have students who are coming out of the classroom into my professional practice, um, that I, who, who I've trained, who I have tried to, as best I could, because I got it from Rosemary, create a space where they could learn methodology and practice, but also explore the kinds of artists that they want, want to be and give breathing room and space for that. And, um, and now we work together as ensemble, um, as ensemble artists. So I'm gonna ask two of these folks to come up and, and share a bit um, as we go on to this kind of next generation of exploring race and class and gender and, and stereotype, which the dream is to lead to conversations about healing um, and progress. So this is a brief excerpt of a piece that we're currently working on in touring called The Burning, which is about a whole lot of things. Um, it looks at um, two nightclub fires connected across time, one in 1940 and one in contemporary space, and these identities that straddle time that help us to look kind of um, microscopically and in the moment at shared space and, and, and time and how it works. But this excerpt is um, of two women in contemporary space who at this moment, you know, there's a character whose name is Boo. Boo, can you give a shout out? Uh, another character, her name is Broadcast. Broadcast, can you? Okay. And they have this problem right now in that they are struggling and vying for the affection of a very unworthy suitor. And I swear I couldn't help it. I fell in love with him, believing I was in store for a lifetime of compassion and consideration. I never asked for more than he gave. Trying so hard not, not to be the, the black woman guilty of robbing her black man of his manhood. The time came when I really did believe that it was all my fault. That I had selfishly asked for too much. And the least I could do was quit him so he would be free. So, so we quit. quit. And, and that's, that's when, when all the mess started. started. He started telling folks how, how hard he had tried with, with that crazy Easy broad, but and then he, he finally had to quit me. me. I'm walking down the street hearing my secrets on the lips of folks who laughed over moments I understood as intimacy. I had to call him a hypocrite, hypocrite to, to his, his face, face and remind him that no matter how lonely and hurt I was, I, I never, never told a soul about, about the night he wept on my lap over how, how quickly your own, own dreams go down the drain. Was the reality of being a black man here? Him him at 13. 13. And here were my untold stories on the tongues of folks who laughed at me for not knowing anything about love. So, so when, when I found him looking, looking like, like he was in love, love sitting on a bench in, in the middle of a park with a woman who reminded me of how I used to be, I want to say to her, wait until he says he's gonna call. But, but don't. don't. He may seem cool now, but wait until he says he's gonna do something for you. Oh, 
get some for you. And, and he, he don't. don't. He will hurt your feelings. And offend you more often than he makes you feel special. And, and where, where is, is the sense in that? Wait, wait until, until you got to the point where you finally believe that maybe he really does love you. And, and then he do something to make you feel like a burden. Just wait. Just wait. I ran away from the scene. Determined to save her from the pain of realizing that he is an imposter of love. So, so I, I went, went to, to the place where I knew they had been together. together. She's gathering all my things, so I took him out the car window, window one by one, so, so that, that she could really understand that this was not the place for her to be. After her element was safely removed, I attempted to start a fire, but he walked in, so I only had enough time to douse everything with gas, and then she called the police. But I didn't care. I said, girl, I saved your life. My broken heart saved your whole one. So you see, now after all that, I had to have him. So even though we quit, I write, I write him a poem. <laughs> Ego. Don't you know, baby, all I need is a word from you. You're enough for me. You're all that I need. Don't leave me alone. I still feel Don't you know? Don't you know? All I need is to hear you. From you. you. That's all I need. Don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone. I still feel you, feel you. I'm only playing mad for a little while. Just to make you sick, just to see you smile. There's so much inside that I can't control. But you make me whole. Don't leave me alone. I still feel. to Crystal is a little different than Tiana's entry point. I went to school for musical theater at University of Northern Colorado, and even in undergrad, um, I knew that I wanted to be a part of an ensemble company, part of, you know, a working company of actors, and I didn't really want to go to New York, but I ended up there anyway. And then I ended up in Houston um, and was a working equity actor in Houston. And I found myself constantly having to reassure myself that what I was doing wasn't just for self-praise, that it was for the good of society. Because even in undergrad, I thought about completely dropping theater as my major and going into women's studies and all of these things. And... Um, so four years goes by in Houston, and one of my best friends sends me this breakdown, and she's like, you would be perfect for this. They're um, asking for this specific type, and I sent them your name. Just send off your stuff. So I get the pitch um, that Crystal had given. What conference is that pitch from? I don't know. But it, basically, it was a rundown of the burn-in, um, and it had little clips and videos of some of progress theaters work and I remember I was sitting in my car in a parking lot and just like chills all over and just thinking like oh my gosh like this is it 
like this is, I have to be a part of this in some way, somehow. And, um, and I've told Crystal this before, but she turned my world like right side up. Um, and she wasn't my teacher in university sense. However, the last year of my life has been more educational than any experience that I had had previous to that. Yes, I had a great knowledge of technique and how to use my body and things like that, but it has been the most soul-driven work being a part of this company. And especially, you know, as each month goes by and we get to tour and um, go to different conferences, you know, I just find myself thinking I could never go back to, I mean, like, my husband just told me, like, oh, we need to pay your equity dues. And I was like, do we really? <laughs> I mean, you know, like, do I see myself in, you know, working out the alley again? Not really, unless it's, like, a crazy, amazing thing that I feel needs to be said. Because the thing is, is, you know, I always tell Crystal that I'm not going anywhere. So you better continue to <laughs> write stuff with white people in them uh, to some extent because, <laughs> you know, because, I mean, like, this is my life's work that she has been, I mean, so gracious to let me be a part of to share in this process. And you said it earlier. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up. But you said it earlier in the thing today about um, performance theater versus freedom theater. And this is really freedom theater for me. So that's me. Hi, I'm Tiana. And um, I, too, came from a family that is very rooted in culture and history and community. Um, and with that, fast forward to me being 19 and ready to go to college, um, I stumbled into Prairie View's doors and um, bumped into Dr. Truscott, who trained me, um, and I feel like I was always a very focused student, like I knew I won an A in every class, like that was the, there was no going lower than that, you know, and um, I actually remember an argument that we had about grades, and she was trying to tell me that it, it can't just be about the grade, it can't just be about the grade, um, and I hadn't considered myself an actor. I considered myself a dancer who was trying to perform in a different medium of sorts. And so um, she was sort of my entry point to that and teaching me um, that it has to be more about the, what kind of artist you want to be and the grade will come after that. And I didn't understand that at the time, <laughs> but um, I have to say with growing um, through that process, I, I, began to under, I began to understand that, and um, it's because of that legacy that led me to wanting to go to graduate school, and I'm now at, um, a graduate acting student at Southern Methodist University. Um, and so now I know that the art that I do and the kind of artist that I want to be must be in community development and history and must change people. Um, I don't know what that means for me as far as how I create it, but I think that she, her legacy has brought me that step of knowing what kind of art I want to do and knowing that it's a possibility, so. I just feel really lucky to have witnessed all of that, and, and just big thanks to all four of you. I have a quick question. Um, there was a, there, it seems to be like a, an evolution, you know, like uh, uh, the, the arguments that you had are very different from the arguments you had, like, like a trajectory. And is that, a, is, that a, is that an evolution, do you think, in culture, in 
the academy, or mm -hmm. is that just coincidence? Um, no, I think it's a key point because I think my, you know, and I said, um, I said attitude and I don't want to conflate it to that because it was really a seriousness and a frustration with wanting to do all of these things. Attitude is what was said about me, right? But what was actually going on was the weight of all of what I wanted and, and what I wanted to be and not having a space in a place that was supposed to be about giving students a space. And so I think the evolution for me is that I, as an educator, came in very keen to making sure that the space was there. So my students never had to worry about space, so there could be these new arguments, you know, that we could start in the middle of that conversation where I was starting a step back, that it's a conversation about, okay, now having been without a space and being able to create a space, now here's the beginning of that conversation, you know, and I think even, you know, with, Tiana, who's a, you know, she, she says, no, she sounds like me, she starts like, I don't know about this teaching thing, but I'm like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but then that there'll be a different argument there, you know, between her and her students. I mean, I think that that's the point of, you know, being dis descendants, artistic descendants, you know, and the genealogy of all of this is that that's the dream in a lot of ways. You know, even if we think about in terms of our parents that they want us to have you know, different struggles than they had. You don't want to repeat this cycle of learning the same lesson. So that, um, so I think the evolution is, is real and that it also is in, for me, creating a space where um, that there was, the, the, the erasure was not a part of the standard. You know, that it was really about bringing in everything that makes you 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 know, into this process and figuring out what you want it to be. I feel like someone said earlier, I think the Rosemary, you said this in your talk, that the art is the art because of who we are, not because of who we are not, you know, or, you know, trying all of these um, types of things. So that's a short answer. Yeah. Other questions? Um, thank you. I really enjoyed that performance and I'm enjoying this discussion so much. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the audiences who have seen that piece and the kinds of conversations that it has provoked. Well, <laughs> this is about a fifth or a third of the piece. So it's really, yeah, it's less than that. Is it 200th net? What would you, what percentage would you say? One 100th, okay. It's a very small portion of it, you know, and even in sharing this was like, gosh, how do we excerpt something that's about the journey? Or even in the piece that I shared from Rosemary's class, we were having this, con you know, because that monologue itself is about 30 minutes long, right? So there's this long journey of deconstruction um, of, you know, stereotype and all these things. But, um, and then I might, you know, kind of put some folks who've seen the show on the hot seat to talk about what those conversations um, have been like. But um, they're not always easy conversations. You know, I think it's, um, so there are triggers for some folks. There are things that people recognize. I mean, the, the piece kind of weaves in and out, in my opinion, of kind of inviting people in through these archetypes that they recognize and then going on this other journey that that shifts but there's a whole other layer you know i mean these women in the 1940s version of their characters play a different set of women that are also also interrogates race relations and gender relations between black and white women you know in the deep south in 1940 and so really um all of these things so i think i'm gonna stop talking and ask someone who's seen the play to maybe talk or share about that, will you? Sure. Yeah? Uh, okay. I, uh, I saw the burn-in at um, Imagining America just a couple weeks ago, and um, something that's so powerful about the piece, and you're right, it's a really, really, really small excerpt of it, and it's so, uh, so vast in scope in a, in a good way, I think, that it, uh, first of all, it has a really distinct call to action in the piece uh, that I think uh, is, extremely effective, 
Uh, it also, this, they had some of the um, amazing work that you do with um, the, the uh, neo-spiritual work that you do. Um, and a great part about it is that there's, you know, over 15 to 20 minutes where you are actually, you all are just singing um, and are just singing and you don't need to have the intellectual dialogue or maybe yeah like that uh, that really um that really kind of emotionally distant dialogue about um about racial strife um in this country and the history and things like that because we're seeing it just in the song and nothing more needs to be said so uh there's i i don't know i feel like it's a really really powerful piece and um those were just some of the things that stuck with me about it I got to see the piece at Alternate Roots this summer and I saw it at Imagine America. And one thing that was a real great lesson in this conversation about ensemble work and the university, um, uh, they got to share an excerpt on one night at Alternate Roots but couldn't share the whole piece. And then the company very responsibly made the decision to go up to the chapel and have an open rehearsal and run the whole piece again to make sure that the audience could go and finish the journey. Because they, as Brad Krumholtz said yesterday, are we making work that vibrates the molecules in the room? And in this case, this work definitely was vibrating some molecules and really touching on some deep things. And so that was like a big thing for me that I really honored to say, you're now gonna take the responsibility for your work. Because <laughs> if you wanna open those, those conversations up, People are gonna to wanna to have that conversation. And so the next day they re-ran the whole piece and then you could just walk up and sit down in the chapel and finish the piece for yourself. And I was like, wow, even Roots had skipped that part, you know, um, as conscious as Roots is. And so that, that's the kind of thing, like what does the work require and are our relationships gonna allow us to fulfill what the work requires was brought up for me, so. Uh, any last questions? Uh, I'm aware of time, uh, and, and then that you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I make sure that we that we give the work what it what it requires. So, um, thank you all. Uh, and I'll just say, if anyone wants to talk further or share what your experience was, you know, we can begin. Hi. <laughs> um, we can begin. We can. You know, we're around to do that conversation, you know, and to connect it to this, com you know, this symposium and the space, but also in just thinking about these genealogies of artistic practice and how it makes its way into the work and then makes its way back into the audience. So for us, this doesn't have to be the end. If, if you're moved to want to say more, or talk more, or share more, or ask more, then by all means, you are welcome. Thank you all. Um, hey, y'all, uh, that was the end of day two. We're here. Woo! So really quick announcements. Uh, hey, tonight, time changes, so you get to fall back. Yes, that's right. So there's a time change. Uh, so if you get here at, uh, at the previous time, you'll be here early. That's okay. That just means you're eager, and we will be here an hour later. Uh, so wait for us. Uh, so the other thing is when you arrive tomorrow, make sure you bring your badge with you and your program. The, the badge lets the security folks know that you're here and it, it'll just make it easier for you to enter. So, uh, so if you can remember to do that, that would be great. And the, uh, the last thing is uh, tomorrow we start at 10.30, so it's a little later. Uh, we will wrap up by one o'clock, so you can get uh, one thirty rather, so you can get to your planes and uh, and to your afternoons. But uh, some really amazing programming plan, uh, uh, planned for tomorrow as well. So uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to say have a good night. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you in the morning. <laughs>